So a uh, 26-year-old university student presents to her doctor in Adelaide uh, with headache and uh, uh, left-sided weakness. Was referred to a neurosurgeon, a very senior neurosurgeon, uh, who made the diagnosis of a pretty nasty-looking brain tumour uh, and felt that the best option was to do surgery. Uh, she took the patient to the operating room uh, and within about 30 minutes she'd lost so much blood uh, that in fact the operation had to be terminated um, just with the skin incision. The patient then presented to me and I said, well, she's a very senior neurosurgeon, very good, uh, but I think it's, uh, your only option is surgery uh, and uh, we'll organise it with some preoperative embolisation, which means that the tumour was so bloody, in fact, uh, that uh, it was fed by so many blood vessels that it was obvious it was going to bleed terribly and we should try and block off those blood vessels before the operation. Uh, these two images I think demonstrate to you uh, the enormity of the problem. The tumour is that white blob right in the middle of the brain which uh, kind of looks like almost a third of the total volume of the brain uh, and the picture uh, to your uh, right uh, is an angiogram that shows the blood vessel supplied to that tumour which is uh, like about a hundred carotid arteries to one tumour. Uh, she went to the angiogram suite uh, after eight hours of hard toil and a lot of embolizations. Uh, the uh, radiation uh, uh, doctor calls me up and says, Charlie, we've done, but unfortunately it's incredibly vascular and I think we've probably only got a small percentage of the blood vessels that went to that, uh, uh, that tumour. Uh, that was at 7 o'clock at night. She was transferred back to the ICU. Uh, and at 9 o'clock, while I was having dinner, uh, my registrar gets a call saying that she's blown a pupil and is unconscious uh, and looking pretty bad, looking like she's going to die. Uh, five, to five past nine, I get the call. At 9.30, we have her on the operating room table. And we decide that the only thing that could save her life, of course, is to take the tumour out. Despite the fact that it's nine o'clock at night, uh, we had eight uh, very good staff members in the operating room with us, uh, and I started operating. Well, I too, unfortunately, lost so much blood with the skin incision that she had a first cardiac arrest uh, 40 minutes after the skin incision uh, from massive blood loss, uh, and then uh, the night just went from bad to, <laughs> bad to worse. Uh, essentially, it goes something like this. Uh, at three o'clock in the morning, uh, she had had three uh, cardiac arrests. Uh, there was a total of one hour with uh, uh, external cardiac massage. Uh, she'd lost 96 units of blood, uh, five times the total blood volume. Uh, they'd given her lots of uh, uh, fresh frozen plasma and packed cells to try and replenish all those lost products. Factor eight, factor seven, all these different factors to try and stop her from bleeding. Uh, while they were pumping on her chest, I was trying to stop the bleeding from the tumour. I managed to get the skull off, but I still hadn't got the tumour out. Uh, and at 3 o'clock in the morning, uh, now with 30 staff in the operating room, two people pumping the uh, IVs to get the uh, blood in so that we can keep her alive. Uh, runners running back and forth between the operating room and the blood bank to try and uh, replenish her blood loss. Uh, the anaesthetist and all my colleagues who I'd call in to help me uh, said it's probably time to quit. Uh, the tumour wasn't even out and we'd been uh, at it for uh, six hours already uh, and there was just blood everywhere, we are all exhausted uh, and uh, that's uh, a picture that was taken with the anaesthetist and my colleague saying to me, look Charlie, I think it's time to quit. I was not prepared to quit, I saw this patient as my own uh, child, uh, she was uh, of a similar age to my own children and I thought I've just got to try and try and try. So. Uh, uh, with their permission and uh, their blessing, I and my team, uh, I did a finger dissection of the tumour. Now that means, like in the olden days before we had microscopes and microsurgical instruments, uh, the courageous surgeons of the olden days would just get their fingers in, just whip out the tumour and then try and stop the bleeding. And uh, uh, it's a bit cavalier, but, uh, <laughs> but in that situation, uh, it called for those sort of measures. So. I whipped the tumour out and of course, yes, you can imagine, just blood shot out everywhere. Uh, she had another cardiac arrest um, and uh, while she was pumping, uh, well, while her heart had stopped beating, uh, 
there was time for me to stop the bleeding and the bottom line is that by nine o'clock in the morning, uh, I, after 12 hours of uh, hard toil, uh, we saved her life and she uh, was transferred back to the ICU alive. The, uh, the end result is also just as good and that is that uh, within three days she was off the ventilator, uh, conscious. Yes, she uh, was paralysed down her uh, left side, but she was in a wheelchair and paralysed before the operation, and she was marginally worse, but really not that much worse, and has now gone back to being a university student. It's a great story. I think it's a great story that demonstrates the positive trait of tenacity uh, and dogged perseverance. I'd like to tell you another story, however, and that's the story of a young boy who... Uh, as a beautiful young boy, I just I will never forget the way he interacted with his younger brother. He was very caring and and compassionate, despite the fact he was only eight years of age. Uh, lovely parents, and he had a tumor called a brainstem glioma. Well, brainstem gliomas are terrible tumors. They have been considered inoperable by most neurosurgeons in the world uh, because the brainstem is this structure that's about the size of your thumb, uh, through which all the uh, Neurons from the cerebrum travel to the spinal cord. Uh, so essentially everything uh, runs through the brain stem. Uh, furthermore, it has within it uh, the areas that control breathing and pulse rate and swallowing and eye movement. It's, it's so, so vital and so eloquent uh, that uh, any surgery on the brain stem is considered uh, uh, taboo and very much out of bounds. It accounts for about 10% of all the tumours we see in children. Uh, unfortunately, brain cancer accounts for more deaths of Australian children than any other disease. Uh, so 10% of those people who die from brain cancer, those kids who die from brain cancer, die from brain stem tumours. A very brave neurosurgeon many years ago decided to operate on them with some varying results, and I took up the challenge and started operating on brain stem gliomas uh, about uh, 20 years ago. I too have had some great results, but I've also had some very bad results. And this young boy who I operated on was one of those terrible results uh, where, again, through dogged perseverance, I wouldn't take no for an answer. He was such a beautiful boy. And we tried chemo. That didn't work. We tried more chemo. That didn't work. We tried radiotherapy. That didn't work. More experimental therapy. And then finally, it got to the stage where the tumour was actually quite isolated. And I thought that I could take it out and serve him well. And by that, I mean simply buy him some time so that we could try possibly another medication or another treatment. Took him to the operating room, uh, tried my hardest. It was difficult to ascertain the difference between the tumour and the normal brainstem, but I thought I got it right. Uh, but unfortunately, he never woke up after surgery. Uh, not only did he not wake up, but it's worse than that. And that is, he had a syndrome called the locked-in syndrome where he was fully conscious uh, but unable to move or say anything. Uh, a terrible situation, not only for him, but for his poor old parents who then had to make the decision to turn the machine off uh, a week later. So you can't get a worse outcome than that. And uh, uh, so I guess the driving force for both of those cases, one with a good outcome and one with a bad outcome, was this, uh, uh, what we believe as society to be a great trait, and that is tenacity. Uh, I have it. Uh, that trait of tenacity, but sometimes I question my own um, motivation and my own reasoning as to why I should operate on something that's so inoperable as a brainstem glioma. They all die anyway, brainstem gliomas, patients with brainstem gliomas, so I've, I've often rationalised to myself that, you know, well, they're going to die anyway, why don't we give it a shot? Uh, but that's not good enough, and it happens every day that I'm faced with the dilemma of trying to decide uh, whether it's worth persevering or not. Uh, I hate to say this, but uh, uh, those of you who know me may be telling that I, I'm not in the same upbeat mood that I'm normally in, and it's the reason being is because I operated on another brainstem glioma yesterday, and again, a very bad outcome, uh, where it's a beautiful lady with a beautiful family and a lovely husband, and I paint that picture because, you know, it's often easy for a doctor to think of a patient as a, as a tumour or as a case. But uh, these are real people with real families and loved ones. And she's got lovely, three lovely kids and she made the decision to go ahead with surgery. And now she hasn't woken up from the operation. 
Uh, and uh, I'm in this terrible place now, again, questioning my own motivation and, and motives for, uh, for operating. So I was hoping I could come here today and, and share, share, share something with you. And what I wanted to share with you was that uh, after 30 years of clinical practice, I was hoping I could actually come in and tell you that, you know, this is how you do it. This is how you differentiate between sheer tenacity and futility uh, so that you uh, can make that decision up front and hopefully uh, not waste your time, so to speak. Uh, I, I'm sorry, but I haven't come up with an answer. Uh, I've done a lot of soul searching over the years. Uh, as one does, I go to Google to try and find the answer. <laughs> and uh, I thought that Google might be able to help me. I thought that my wise friends might be able to help me. Uh, because, you know, it is a waste of time. If you spend years and years and years on a pursuit that uh, you know, or you don't know, but you, that may come to absolutely no fruition, uh, it wouldn't be great if you could spend that time and money and effort on something else. Uh, look. This is how I look at it. I tr I've, tr I've gone to the medical ethicist to try and uh, to help me. I've, I've researched, uh, I've spoken to people, and you know they've all come up with their certain theories. Like, oh no, Charlie, it's all about risk benefit. Well, you know, risk benefit is one thing, and 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 the point is this: that uh, if the uh, benefit is so great, then of course it's worth a greater risk. Uh, you would never operate on a patient if there was a significant mortality rate just to straighten one's nose or to increase the size of one's breast. Uh, but if you're looking at saving someone's life, surely the risk is, is worth it. Other medical ethicists talk about this golden figure of 1%, uh, and that is that you know, if there's a 1% chance it might work, then you should probably pursue it. If there's a less than 1% chance and it's not worth it, it's futile. But, you know, that's crazy because, you know, how does one come up with the 1%? Does that mean a person who has a 0.9% doesn't get a chance? And it doesn't mean that someone who has a 2% chance uh, get, gets a chance. So I don't like that. And then, of course, uh, medical ethicists also talk to us about this whole concept of, you know, it's not uh, one thing. It's several factors that should help you make the decision. You should look to the literature, for example. And they bring up this concept of medical uh, evidence-based medicine. But that's ridiculous too, because if you are waiting to read the literature before you do an operation, of course, you're never going to do an operation, a new operation, because there's no literature to support it. And then they talk about uh, you know, consensus. Well, again, I've tried desperately, and you know, I'm not the most politically correct person. I'm not very diplomatic, but I've tried to sit in on those MDTs, the multidisciplinary team meetings, where everyone sits around and looks for consensus. But, you know, it doesn't work. It doesn't work because you've got people in there who are incredibly ultra-conservative, who will never take a risk, and you've got other people who like taking risks. And so if you're looking for the uh, consensus, then, of course, consensus will be made by following the, the, the weakest chain in the link or the most conservative person in the room. Uh, so I've had to come up with my own theory, and this is what I'd like to... Uh, share with you today and that is that after 30 years of clinical practice and after having to make these decisions every day about you know the futility of surgery or otherwise uh, and not only that my pursuit of trying to find a cure for brain cancer as well uh, I'm sure you've heard that I used to have a foundation that I left uh, I started up a new one uh, and the reason I left was multifactorial but the bottom line was that uh, I reflected on the efforts that I'd gone to over the last 20 years to find a cure for brain cancer. A lot of time, a lot of good people's money, uh, millions of dollars, uh, uh, a sense of collaboration, trying to get the world to think together, thinking globally. And when I'm honest with myself, I've reflected on those last 20 years. And in fact, you know, patients today have no better outcome than they did when I started the, that foundation. Uh, so I'm always faced with this dilemma of, you know, what is futile, what is worthwhile? And I've come up with this. Well, I didn't come up with it. My, my fellow who's a, a neurosurgeon from America said to me, this is what you've got to say. You've got to tell people exactly what you told the husband of that lady yesterday. And I sat down with him yesterday and I said, look, I am so sorry. Uh, your wife hasn't woken up after surgery. We tried our hardest. Technically, the surgery went very well and I have no idea. Uh, why it's gone so badly. But I can reassure you of this, that I tried my hardest uh, and I don't want you or myself uh, to think that we made the wrong decision. You made the decision, she made the decision. I concurred with the decision that this was worthwhile. 
Why? Because we were doing it in her best interest. She's got three young children. She, was, she knew that without surgery, she was going to die a very rapid death. The tumour was already getting bigger as we spoke. And that surgery was her only chance of extended life. And with extended life comes hope, hope that we come up with other medications and other treatments for brain cancer. We made the decision in her best interests. We made the decision because we believed that it was the right thing to do, even though what looks like, it looks like that it's probably, uh, uh, the, it was probably the wrong thing to do. Uh, so I'd like to share this with you. When you are faced with the dilemma about futility or whether you should be tenacious to, to pursue a goal. When your child comes up to you, your chubby little vertically challenged child and says, I want to be an NBA sort of uh, star. Uh, how are you going to uh, tackle that question? And I think it's very easy. It's all about uh, the greater good. It's all about the worthiness of, the pers of what you're pursuing. And it's all about a non-selfish uh, attitude to hold the whole problem. If it's if you're doing it for yourself, if you're doing it for a claim, for personal gain, for financial gain, for celebrity, for fame, uh, if you're doing it because you fear to fail, if you're doing it because uh, it's, a, a, it's, it's your goal to be perfect, then you're going to come a buster. And it's, you're going to look back and, and it's not going to be worth it. And it's going to be considered wasted time. But if you're doing it for the right reasons, for the greater good, for that person's greater good, for community's greater good, for the betterment of mankind, then it can never be considered futile. Thank you.